East Coast and, and so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Noah Lenstra speaking to you from uh, University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, and so this is our, our final session um, in cultivating the relationship driven library. Um, uh, if, if you'd like to see our previous sessions uh, throughout the month of April on Thursday afternoons, uh, we've had conversations with uh, public librarians talking about how they uh, cultivate the um, uh, relationships in their communities uh, and how that work uh, um, has benefit for themselves, their libraries, and their communities. Um, and today we are really uh, want to discuss uh, where do we grow from here? Um, how can we uh, continue to build out uh, the relationships that matter um, in our communities? Um, uh, and I just have a few kind of preliminary remarks, um, and then I'm going to turn things over to uh, Beth uh, DeFarber, um, uh, who has uh, a lot of really uh, amazing insights to share with you. Um, but just want to start uh, um, just with uh, who who we are. Um, so uh, 363 uh, individuals have registered for this event uh, during during the month of April. Um, and so uh, the vast majority being public librarians uh, with a smattering of kind of uh, people who support uh, public librarians, library educators, researchers, consultants, um, a few non-library people, um, and then a few people of other backgrounds. But really, uh, this is uh, what we're really talking about is, is public librarians. Um, uh, and how do we do this work as public librarians uh, with communities? Um, uh, the people who registered for this event um, also represent uh, a wide variety of communities. We asked people, what communities do you serve? Um, uh, and participants were asked to select all that apply. So uh, strong representation in all community types, uh, but particularly in small town uh, and rural um, communities. Um, and like I said, uh, we've been featuring during the month of April some voices uh, from the field. Um, and so if you missed uh, any previous conversation, as well as the launch of our toolkit, um, uh, those uh, videos are now posted uh, in our YouTube channel. Um, and I'll be sharing a link to that momentarily. Uh, as a registrant, you'll also have access to um, those uh, in, a, in an email follow up. Um, that I will be sending to everyone uh, next Monday. Um, but want to thank you all individually um, for coming today um, and for, for participating um, in this event. Um, and, and what we really want to talk about again today is where do we uh, collectively uh, grow from here? Um, and so these are the things that uh, people told us when they registered um, they might be uh, interested in doing uh, after, after this event in April. So we have some people interested in trying out our toolkit. Um, and hopefully many of those people will also be interested um, in another opportunity that we'll be introducing uh, momentarily. Um, uh, people are also interested in, in continuing to have regional and national conversations about how we cultivate the relationship-driven library um, and incorporate and leverage uh, partnerships into our, our um, modus operandi uh, as librarians, um, people interested uh, in sharing their stories to inspire others. Um, uh, and I see some people in the chat sharing some other reasons uh, why you're here and, and what you hope to gain and contribute. Um, and, and just before uh, I turn things over, uh, for those of you who joined uh, our first session, I just want to reiterate uh, really kind of why, why we think this is important. Why, why do we think it's important to cultivate the relationship-driven library? Um, and really, this is an evidence-based uh, assumption. So uh, three years ago in, in 2020, um, I started a project uh, really trying to understand um, how and why were public librarians working collaboratively with others uh, to support um, community health, um, and in particular, healthy eating and active living. Um, so in that project, uh, I interviewed um, uh, about 70 librarians at all levels, everything from paraprofessionals to library directors, um, as well as about 60 partners, um, and talking to partners uh, representing United Way, YMCA, um, 
parks and recreation, hospitals, uh, uh, health foundations, health departments, um, area agencies on aging, um, et cetera, and et cetera. Uh, one of the overall takeaways um, that we that we found um, is that uh, uh, people do not naturally look to public librarians as partners. Uh, that's not a perception that we have in communities. Uh, it's not natural for people to say, I'd like to start a community garden. Let me go talk to my public librarian. That doesn't happen, uh, or it doesn't typically happen. Um, and so really the task before us um, is if we want to do this work, um, really comes down to perceptions and visibility. Um, how do we transform the profile of the public library uh, from what is often seen as a book repository uh, to a trusted resource? Um, to ideally uh, changing uh, public perception so that librarians, uh, the people who work in libraries, um, are seen uh, as the people that others want to work with um, to uh, do great work in our communities. Um, um, and, and really what we found is that what stands in the way of libraries and librarians being part of cultures of health, um, in a word, it comes down to perceptions. Uh, and what we found uh, again and again in our interviews um, is that unless you, you as an individual um, or someone from your library uh, is already working with health or other social service organizations, they do not think of you. They, they may think of your library, they may be aware that their community has a library, but they really do not see you. They don't see the people who work in your library. You are by and large invisible to them. Um, and so uh, we we think that's a reality that, that should be changed. Um, and we wanna talk about how we do that. Um, um, and if people think of libraries at all, they they typically will think of um, what can what can the library do for me? Can the library distribute information for me? Can the library host an event? Uh, can the library market something? Um, uh, but we uh, at the same time, glass half empty, glass half full. Um, we also find uh, in communities across America. Um, people increasingly find success asking how can we work together. Um, and similarly, librarians, library workers feeling overwhelmed, uh, feeling burnt out, um, often feel like they have to ask, uh, do I have the space, budget, or staff uh, to do this? Um, uh, and they increasingly find success asking, who can I work with uh, to get the job done uh, and meet the needs of my community? Um, and I'm not going to share the whole toolkit now, um, but uh, uh, we we have developed this toolkit really focused on helping uh, librarians uh, identify um, where where it looks like uh, uh, there's a promising uh, area to uh, unite needs and interests. So so here's a need. Here's people interested in meeting that need. Um, how can we work together to get the job done? Um, uh, and then nourishing uh, that partnership uh, to help it along, um, uh, taking the time to celebrate uh, the great work that comes from, from that effort that you and your partners have put in, um, and then uh, taking the time to collectively debrief, um, uh, see, see what happened as you worked uh, collaboratively with your community while simultaneously preparing uh, for the future. And like I said, uh, you can access the whole one hour kind of overview we provided for the toolkit uh, on our YouTube channel. And I'll put the, the link um, into the chat. Um, uh, but for today, I'm just going to, uh, I'm really, really excited um, uh, and trying to move quickly through this preliminary content because I'm I'm really super excited to, to introduce you all um, to Beth uh, DeFarber. Um, uh, who for most much of her career worked at, at Florida State University um, uh, in the library, uh, responsible for, for grant writing um, and grant development. Um, and she also has uh, written this amazing book, uh, Collabor Collaborating with Strangers, Facilitating Workshops and Libraries, Classes and Nonprofits. Um, uh, and as uh, Beth uh, says here, uh, once you inquire or about exchanging assets with another organization, uh, the magic happens. Um, and so without uh, further ado, um, I'm going to turn things over to Beth um, uh, and, and she will take it away. Give me one second. Yeah, go, go ahead, Beth. 
Okay, so I'm not seeing my slides, but I think oh, they're there. Yeah, you need to click the share screen button again. Okay, hold on. Um, eh, yeah, take your time. I'm, yeah, when, so, I, when I took over the screen, it kind of stopped your screen sharing. But if you click that green button down at the bottom, it should. I uh, know, I'm not getting my, hold on. Uh, Well, 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 Beth is doing that. I'll just say, uh, yeah, I would love to know who's in the room. Thanks, uh, Kendra and Jennifer, for for introducing yourselves, and and we'd love to know kind of um, who else is here with us uh, today, um, and kind of uh, where you're from, and and what you're what you're uh, interested in in gaining or contributing from from today's session. I'm trying to find my my toolbar, and I can't find it. I see you. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Ah. Share my screen, share this. Okay, are we are we here? Yep, yep, yep. and you might just okay. want to figure out. There we go, yep, it looks like perfect. Okay, yeah, there we go. Here. Well, thank you, Noah, for inviting me to share this presentation. I've enjoyed participating and learning from all the other presenters and participants during this ser series. If any aspect of this presentation resonates with any of you, please share your thoughts in the chat. In 2002, I received a call from the Community Foundation of Broward. I had been consulting in South Florida on grant seeking, nonprofit management, and collaboration development. The problem they wanted me to solve was that after the 9-11 attacks, funding had decreased, organizations were competing for fewer awards, and small and minority organizations were suffering the most. Could I create a workshop where organization representatives would walk away with actual partnerships and resources? I convened a group of Broward funders and asked them, what they thought of this idea, speed meetings where participants would wear profile signs on their torsos describing assets available within their organization. My experience as a grant maker exposed the frustration of nonprofit staff not knowing what each other was doing in communities and the redundancy that this produced. I'd ask myself, why isn't this organization partnering with this other applicant organization on the project they proposed in their grant application? So the funders advised they would, they thought it would work, but that the workshop had to be free to any organization staff member that wanted to attend. Here you see the Broward County Collab workshop participants. 50 organization representatives participated over two days. Each participant met 49 other organization staff members during speed meetings. And then at idea tables, they developed par partnership ideas and many didn't want to leave when the workshop was over after the second day. So let's just review kind of what a collab is. So collab workshops or either in person or online have served 3,500 over 3,500 participants during workshops that at a minimum had 14 participants and up to over 100 when it's done in a conference setting. The profiles uh, describe either the organization, if, if there are organization representatives, it describes their assets, so their programs, um, the number of people they serve, their sponsors, their partnerships, et cetera, and their mission. And if it's for individuals, then those individuals share their professional passions, their work, their research, their studies, or their interests. It's a cafe-like environment that uses three to four minute speed meetings. What, what they're doing is learning about other people's assets that spark ideas for sharing resources and new partnerships. So they're reading the profile sign of the person that they're, they're partnering with. They have a checklist so they can take notes about that specific person and what their conversation was. So after they read the sign, they have a conversation about what interests them um, and each other. 
So each, each workshop presents either seven rounds all the way up to 50 rounds. So you might have conversations with 49 other people, or you might have at least seven conversations. After those are finished, there are debriefing uh, questions that include, and they're always the same. What synergies did you discover? What did you learn? What are your next steps? And if it's organizations that being, are, are being represented, who do you want to partner with and how? After everyone has met each other, or at least we've had seven rounds of conversations, we may be able to have time if it's a longer workshop for idea table workshop of the idea table workshop that goes hand in hand with the collab. So this works with groups of three or five part three to five participants at a table, and they have 20 minutes to answer the question, what collaboration ideas exist at this table? That's the opportunity in which they are simply practicing the art of idea generation with each other based on the assets that are there. And once you have an idea, you automatically think of the needs that that idea would benefit or, or would overcome in your community or in your, in your area. And we do this three times at three different tables so that you are having conversations with other people in the room. Then each table debriefs what happened at their table and those are ideas are categorized and then they're prioritized. People vote on the ideas that they like the best. And then they sit at separate tables where their interest is featured and plan out their projects. So I started to get requests from sponsors to present collabs for different purposes and in different communities. Here we have collabers in South Palm Beach County from arts organizations from the Florida Atlantic University College of the Arts and those who work with the Junior League with the goal of increasing collaborative projects and, in, uh, and sharing resources. And this was in South County, South Palm Beach County. This is an idea table conversation after all participants had completed the speed meetings. Other workshops included the collab in Belle Glade, which is uh, represented communities around the Lake Okeechobee area, which are often minoritized and also underserved, and uh, the Martin County Literacy Collab, where we had all types of businesses and um, people who are interested in literacy coming together for a few days of discussion to solve the problem of literacy in that community. Next, you see four students who were representing themselves and their experiences in public schools and how they access healthcare information. This was a series of two hour evening workshops. Three, we had three workshops with invited organizations who were interested in applying for funding to prevent HIV AIDS infections in the county. At the end of the series, partners self-selected to apply for funding through United Way, who was looking for innovative solutions in serving in underserved communities. One of the awarded partnerships was between American Red Cross and Catholic Charities. The Red Cross had developed workshops on prevention and Catholic charities had relationships and translators who work in Guatemalan migrant communities. So here, after the speed meetings, part of the workshop participants, uh, after the speed meeting part of the workshop, participants were given note cards on which to write all of the different organizations they wanted to partner with and what they wanted to do together. These were all collected and transcribed for the second day of the workshop so everyone could read what ideas came out of the speed meetings. I'll let you read some of these ideas.
I accepted the grants manager position at the University of Arizona Libraries in 2005 and began facilitating collab workshops for library employees, especially new ones, and librarians plus faculty participants. Here you see the Sonoran Desert knowledge, uh, here you see the Sonora Desert collab. The problem we wanted to solve was that many agencies, museums, and researchers were working in the desert, but they didn't know each other and they didn't know who was doing what. 28 participants attended plus five STEM librarians. A central idea emerged that perhaps they needed to create a Sonora Desert Knowledge Exchange. And here you see the pre-prepared um, collab profile signs with information about each of the participants organizations or if they were researchers or individuals who were participating what their area of interest was and why they were passionate about that work. In 2008, I was invited to present a pre-conference on the CoLab model for 65 participants from all over the world at the Association of College and Research Library Conference. This was the first time participants prepared their own profile signs that shared their passions, skills, projects, partnerships, and one thing most people don't know about them. In 2008, I was recruited to create a collaborative grant seeking program for librarians and faculty at the University of Florida Libraries, and in 2009 facilitated my first collab at UF. What followed were more than 50 collab workshops over a 12 year period. Here you see the first collab for the UF College of the Arts with almost 100 faculty and staff participating. The problem administrators were trying to solve was the silos in which each department worked. Theater faculty didn't work with visual arts faculty, etc. So each profile sign was color coded and participants answered three questions on the spot having received the questions in advance. I learned later that a new interdisciplinary course came out of this workshop. There was no time during the workshop to debrief, however, so a lot of what happened is a mystery to me. I created a project team comprised of the director of communications within the libraries and a few librarians who wanted to facilitate these workshops with me in 2010. And we started applying for grant funds to hire a student and to pay an evaluator to help us validate what was happening during and after the workshops. Here you see two of the first 12 collab workshops that were funded. On the top, um, this was a collab that had no theme. This was just who wants to collaborate with strangers they don't know. And what we found was we had a huge number of international students who were thrilled to come to the libraries and meet each other and learn about who was doing what and studying what. And it was a way for them to find friends. And the uh, below, you see, that we had 80 participants sign up for the Collaborating with Strangers on Sustainability at the University of Florida. And it was a combination of faculty members and students. Uh, and we, we were simply overwhelmed with the desire on this, on this topic for people to connect. The project team started receiving requests for other thematic workshops. Here you see Health, the Health Science Center librarians meeting faculty members and students in a National Medical Libraries sponsored collab for the topic Sex and Gender Differences in Health. The second workshop below, another collab was sponsored by the Women in Science and Engineering to expose prospective students who were looking for mentors to to faculty who wanted to mentor students. Again, we use the color coding of profile signs to indicate who were students and, and faculty participants. Finally, the team organized a collab for the librarians within the university, which I think we have close to 100 at the University of Florida who wanted to know the research interests and projects of their colleagues. So that that was a, a culmination of, of the series. 
but other workshops were held in at the University of Florida classes for grant writing and PhD students in journalism and communications for the UFPR club. Uh, for the College of Ed faculty and rural public school teachers. So we were out in the community doing that collab. Um, also the UF Office of Sustainability sponsored a workshop with Gainesville nonprofits who were working on issues related to sustainability. The UF Health, uh, Health, Health Science Center also um, had a project working with Gainesville nonprofits on HIV AIDS prevention. And then there were UF faculty in other departments asking to learn more about their colleagues teaching research projects and publications. What do participants get after the workshop? They get the book of signs of all the participants so they can review who was there and what was written on the signs. They get the transcript of all the post-it debriefing notes and they get the evaluation results from the surveys. So here you see the idea boards where we received comments from student, uh, from whoever was participating. The question was, what synergies did you find? And, um, so this helped reflect on what were the areas and concepts that people seemed to really connect and bond over. And here you see one, many librarians specializing in my research field and areas of interest, gender health disparities. So all of these were related to sex and gender differences in health. Here was the next question, what did you learn? So we wanted to learn what kinds of new knowledge, ideas, or resources were acquired and what seemed to resonate most with participants. So here you see Latinos don't readily seek medical treatment, have a fatalistic mentality or a fatalist mentality. So there was lots of different types of learning that happened during these workshops. And finally, what are your next steps? Were next steps mostly about following up with others or expanding or, uh, on what they've learned. And so here, you know, it says, reach out to the people who shared the interests, especially librarians. Um, and these would be good people to connect to. So the funding that we got funded a student and an evaluator. And we wanted our evaluator to find out information that answered these questions. Who was participating? Where were they from? How often do participants routinely speak to strangers in their discipline and outside their discipline? What happens to participants during the workshop? What kinds of new knowledge, ideas, or resources are acquired? How are participants responding to the process? Do they seem inspired and engaged? What happened after the workshop? So, here you have some, uh, some results. This is our evaluator, Dr. David Miller um, from the College of Ed. And he says, participants often began speed meetings hesitantly. However, they quickly saw the value of the meetings. The change in the environment was obvious by the third round. It gets really loud when, when we're having in-person sessions. There were clearly observable changes with an increase in the volume of discussions, participants standing closer together and greater animation among the participants, including pointing at each other's uh, profile signs. So <clears throat> then we also would have anecdotal, we would try to capture what happened from our own observations. Someone yelled out, you're just like me. Um, participants giving a high five or laughing. And then one participant said, I forgot I was nervous by the end. Okay, so, so we were able to gather uh, pre-workshop surveys. So in this particular one, 80% of the students in two public relations classes agreed that they didn't, they were comfortable with face-to-face -face conversations. But then um, they also said more than 50% said they were having fewer conversations than two, they only had fewer than two conversations per month with people that they didn't know about pro their class projects or about their careers.
And then we had post surveys and post workshop surveys were located on the back of the profile sign. And so we had folks filling out this information and we wanted to know how they felt um, after the workshop, if they agreed that um, they were more confident talking to people in their discipline, outside of their discipline, and um, talking to people at different levels of their careers. So this student said, absolutely, I learned so much about my discipline, about other disciplines and uh, opportunities for collaboration. It went by so fast. I was deep in conversation and didn't want to part because the biggest problem we experienced was people didn't want to decouple after their three minute conversation. Here's a testimonial that we really found summarized uh, the benefits. I learned how easy it is to begin a conversation with someone else by finding common ground or an interest fact about them. It amazed me how much I had in common with so many of the people I met and how much could be learned from a person simply by filling out a card. So from the profile sign, the evaluator was able to tell us all this information about the individual participants who they were in terms of um, their roles in the university, what departments they represented, what school, what skills they had, and what projects they were engaged in. Other profile information included um, this kind of disciplinary uh, output and also what kind of what percentage of people came, what kinds of people came, but also in, in the first six workshops that we had, you can see all the countries that were represented because we asked for hometown information. And then we had funding for interviews. So we interviewed some of, uh, some of the participants after the workshops, for instance, there were follow-ups with the College of Public Health and Health Professions. The person that's writing this is in the College of Journalism and Communications. We did set up face-to-face -face meetings with some of them as a result of the collab. We ended up forming a co-master's degree. It's a co-master's degree program where students in the College of Public Health can take a series of College of Journalism and Communication classes as an option. So yes, that definitely, that's what came of it. And let's go to another one. So this is from the grants coordinator from the College of Journalism who says, I would say the main benefit of the collab for me was having all of these people in one place. If I needed to reach out to one of the people who participated, it would be so, e so much easier now now that you have the first networking step to say, hey, we were in the same collab and now I'm thinking of this project. So these guiding principles and goals are just a summary of what the collabs are. It's an asset-based community development model where exposing assets helps you think of creative ideas for meeting existing needs that you're aware of in your community. Multiple simultaneous conversations rather than one person talking and 50 people listening. Multiple disciplines all in the same room. A common geography. Um, may be part of the workshop, a singular theme may be part of the workshop, the cafe environment that makes people feel comfortable, um, self-selection where participants, uh, only participants who want to be there are there, hopefully they haven't been sent by anyone um, against their will. Uh, their standard questions, it's always face-to-face, we're trying to build a comfort with ambiguity, not knowing what's going to happen during the workshop, but expecting the best. Um, we're trying to stimulate moments of synchronicity where those uh, interesting connections and commonalities can be exposed. It's a place to generate ideas and solutions for problems that already exist and for resources that already exist. And ultimately learning about resources and people's interests that otherwise would remain hidden. And what I would say is 
it takes a long time to meet someone and get to know them and get to know their assets and what they're interested in and what their passions are. And this workshop expedites that process into it could be an hour and a half or it could be a full day if people have the luxury of spending that time. So that concludes my presentation, Noah. And I just wanted to share the three books that I've written on, uh, on the topic of collaboration, um, mostly in libraries. So I was just hoping to share that. And um, the Collaborating with Strangers workshop uh, workshop book here um, is now in over 800 libraries around the world. So I'm thrilled about that and um, hoping that this presentation exposes the workshop to more people. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Beth. And let's go ahead and just just leave this up for a moment. Um, and and I just wanted to say it's always great great to hear about this model. Um, and I just wanted to pause and go back uh, to one of the very first collabs you mentioned uh, with with the United Way of Palm Beach County. Um, uh, I just wanted to to shine a light on the fact that one outcome from that collab. Um, was you had Catholic Charities, uh, obviously a Catholic-based organization. Um, given some of the yeah issues in the Catholic Church, they were not necessarily in a place to distribute condoms uh, as part of HIV/AIDS prevention. But they had the linguistic expertise uh, with with lots of people who spoke Spanish and had strong connections with immigrant communities. Um, and through the collab, uh, Catholic Charities was able to to get connected and find ways to work collaboratively with organizations um, that were able to kind of get uh, get information um, and even even things like condoms out to communities um, in ways that wouldn't run afoul of kind of Catholic Charities faith-based mission. So I thought that example was just such a such an amazing kind of outcome of kind of the collab. Um, people getting to know each other, what they have, what they can do, what they can't do, um, and then figuring out what how to work together. So just wanted to shine a light on that as a, as a really powerful example of what can come from this process. Um, um, yeah, and I uh, and we did have one question uh, in the chat, uh, Beth. Um, I don't know if you've had any experience uh, trying to do kind of uh, a collab uh, workshop in a virtual environment, um, or if you had any thoughts, uh, given kind of the world that we we find ourselves living in. Um, if you you have any thoughts about kind of whether or not uh, something like this could work in in a kind of virtual environment. Yes, we actually did one um, in 2021 with a um, for a conference on uh, for agricultural librarians all over the country, and we had 20 participants who signed up for this particular workshop within the conference. We used Twine, and um, I worked with the Twine developers, and um, they uh, embedded the the software program within Zoom so that now Twine can be used within Zoom. And um, we, we did a lot of the work ahead of time, ahead of the workshop. So people would register. In order to register, they would have to send answers to the profile questions. And we created a, a file uh, of all of the answers uh, person by person by person so that when you were meeting a person online, using the Twine software, you would first read their profile. Each person would read their profile either online or print it out. And then they would have a conversation for three to four minutes. We would have this cow uh, appear with a warning that the conversation was going to end in 30 seconds because it was an agricultural conference. And so humorously, uh, at the end of 30 seconds, they fly out of the room and they fly into the room with a new partner that they haven't met before. And uh, we did that with seven rounds. Actually, it was 12 rounds. Um, and the Twine uh, programmer was amazed. Actually, he's a co-founder. He said, wow, normally we can only get people to do seven rounds of conversation, but you got them to do 12. <laughs> So it was quite successful. And, um, and yes, so there is a way to do this 
um, successfully. And then we used, um, what's the program you're using now um, for the quick post-it notes? Oh, the Jamboards? The yeah. Jamboard. We used the Jamboard for each of the three questions. So what did, you know, what synergies did you discover? What did you learn? And what are your next steps? And then they wanted an extra one that said what collaborative ideas came out of these conversations. And then they used that as a template or the the beginning to initiate conversations of collaboration within the conference mm -hmm. so they took that out and they they put posted it and and asked people to post collaborative ideas that they were generating during the conference yeah that that's great beth and and i'm glad to hear that you all were kind of able to experiment with new technology and try new things and and just hearing you talk about how kind of someone would be having a conversation with someone and then they would kind of fly out and someone new would come in um it just reminded me uh and some of you in the audience may also be familiar with this there's been a big push uh, in the last few years for for public libraries to host or facilitate human libraries, um, opportunities for people and communities to kind of get to know each other and, and learn about um, each other across differences. Um, and I see this collab model is in some ways very similar to that, um, uh, but it's uh, it's a little bit more action oriented uh, as opposed to um, yeah, just the, the opportunity to to kind of get to know someone in your community that you you might not previously know uh, that, of course, has value. But um, here we're, we're more focused on thinking about how can we use an issue that we all care about, um, uh, but we may not know about others who care about this issue. And let's let's kind of think about um, how can we a get to know each other and b use that information in kind of a, a real real world action oriented way. Um, and I'll just kind of continue on, uh, but, and I would invite others to kind of chime in uh, in the chat with questions or thoughts. Um, the other reason why I really like the CoLab model um, is that during the last few years, there's been a big fo focus on asset-based community development in libraries. Um, uh, but I, I like the collabs kind of quick and dirty approach to asset mapping. You're not you're not kind of spending a lot of time poking around websites and digging through a bunch of data. You're just um, you're meeting people, <laughs> and that's that that to me is like the 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 best way to 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 map assets is to 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 to, look, to meet people. So it's not about assets as kind of static things that exist in institutions. Assets are people, um, and people make institutions. Um, and I'll just kind of, uh, I'm going to take back control of the slides for a minute. Um, and, and kind of what led me to Beth um, and this is, again, um, what we found uh, in this, this big project um, is that uh, librarians are by and large invisible. Uh, people in communities uh, trying to make the community a better place uh, typically do not know who public librarians are. They don't know who they are. They don't know how to work with them. They really uh, may, may say, gosh, wouldn't it be great? Um, if the library could do this, that, and the other, but they really don't know how to work collaboratively with librarians if they're not already working collaboratively with librarians. Um, and wouldn't it be great to kind of change change that reality to kind of, um, and, I, and I really see the collab um, is, is a real promising uh, way to kind of jumpstart that. Um, and it's, it's relatively um, easy to do. Um, and so, but uh, but but there's definitely other other opportunities uh, and other models. Um, and so we'd love to know, kind of, if, if we think about where do we uh, grow from here, kind of, um, uh, how does this resonate with with your experiences in your communities? Um, how have you found uh, ways to ways to grow? Um, and and also um, uh, as you're thinking about that, uh, um, we're we're small but mighty uh, here today. Uh, Beth and I are also um, more than interested. We're in fact uh, planning to uh, apply to the the institute uh, for museum and library services um, on kind of a planning grant um, that would kind of take the collab model um, and really really implement it um, in a small number of kind of um, public libraries uh, across the country. So if you if you might be interested um, in participating uh, in that project, um, you can either just put something in the chat to let us know, um, or you can you can email me. Um, we can we can talk about what that what that might look like. Um, 
but we'd really love to, um, uh, yeah, kind of uh, think about um, how we can use uh, this collab model um, and 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 really and and yeah, look at look at how we could implement it in in public libraries and in public library communities. Um, um, to really, really transform kind of how how librarians are are seen uh, as as partners. Um, um, but yeah, I'll I'll stop talking uh, for for a minute, uh, and I'll I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, uh, we have about fifteen minutes, uh, and we have this set up so that uh, anyone here can turn on their microphone. Uh, everyone has chat privileges, so. Uh, we thought it would just be great to also just uh, just just hear from you all. Um, I know a few people introduced themselves. Uh, Kendra, thanks so much for being here from uh, Web Junction, and Dan uh, from uh, the Colony Public Library and the Dall Dallas Fort Worth area. Jennifer Haywood County Public Library, in North Carolina, uh, and everyone else who's here. Um, Thank you so much for being here, um, and we'd love to love to hear from you. How does how does what you've heard today kind of resonate with any experiences you've had? Um, uh, what what are your thoughts on kind of this this collab model? Um, and do you have any other thoughts on on where where we should grow from here? Um, so the floor is open, and and we'd love to hear from you. Also, if there's um, if there are any barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, to yeah. implementing the collab, we'd like to know because um, Noah and I have uh, talked about having an online course where we would train um, interested library uh, workers who want to learn how to do this in their communities, and then also then support uh, the facilitation of those uh, workshops in communities to see how how it works and also to learn from the library workers about how it could be improved or streamlined for more libraries to be able to present um, or coordinate these even if they don't occur within your library because your library is small um, or you have other um, issues with with actually convening a, a collab within your library. Yeah, that that's a great point, Beth. And and yeah, uh, others feel free to jump in. But uh, uh, as as Beth alluded to, we're really interested in kind of this train the trainer approach. Uh, we'd love to we'd love to see kind of uh, uh, librarians across the country who have uh, had uh, the opportunity to develop experience with this model uh, be able to then kind of turn around um, and share share the model with others uh, in their states or regions. Um, and really kind of uh, uh, with with the long-term goal of really um, through this kind of grassroots effort, transforming kind of how, how public librarians are perceived, uh, shifting from kind of this invisibility um, into instead um, uh, uh, visibly seen, uh, rightly so, as kind of critical partners uh, for anything that a, a local community is trying to, to get done or accomplished. Um, um, and I'll, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll just also add as people are thinking about all of this, um, Beth and I uh, have also been really looking closely at kind of the existing landscape of kind of continuing education opportunities around this topic. Um, and I briefly mentioned kind of asset-based community development and kind of the IMLS as previous community catalyst initiative. Um, we're also, of course, uh, very aware of the Haywood or the Harwood Foundation uh, and their partnership with the American Library Association for Libraries Transforming Communities, um, which has done a great job uh, training uh, public librarians and the fundamentals of dialogue and deliberation, um, which is wonderful, uh, very similar to the wonderful uh, impacts of kind of um, uh, the human library in terms of cultivating opportunities for people to have dialogue across differences. Um, we feel the collab model is a little bit different uh, and, and we think would add to kind of the Harwood Foundation in the sense of moving from kind of dialogue and deliberation into conversations that drive uh, action um, in collaboration. Uh, yeah, uh, Kendra, sorry, I didn't see you had your hand up. Kendra, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you so much for that context and the background. <clears throat> One of the things that occurred to me is that this seems like a really helpful model for library staff with 
at different libraries to be able to get, engage in that that's a huge opportunity for people who work at different systems to really come together and learn from their strengths and their lessons and it seems like a really engaging opportunity for district libraries to organize state libraries so thanks for sharing i really appreciate it yeah, um, Kendra, we actually did uh, one of those. We won the Innovation Award for the North um, Florida uh, Information Network, Florida Information Network. And uh, we ran a collab at this conference and it was all library employees. And um, there were 100 participants and the number of, of ideas that they had for working together was just exponential. Nobody could believe it. And from that, we did an analysis and then we made recommendations to the cons uh, consortium, Nephlin, on what they could do to bring uh, to empower the library employees who were saying, we need to learn from each other. We need more time at each other's libraries. We need, um, we need site visits. We want to hear from the people that do things that we're interested in doing. So that is exactly um, what happened at that one conference. And we've done other conferences uh, for the Florida State um, Library Conference. And we always get the same results. I had no idea that so and so was doing X and I want to learn how to do that and now I'm going to go go connect with that person because I have permission to connect because I met them in a collab and so it's not a cold call as Noah was describing in the previous session it's not cold because you've been in the same workshop together even if you didn't converse you still um, are one of those people who's interested in learning about other people's work and passions. Yeah, I, I, I love that, Beth. And I love this idea of kind of permission to connect uh, from having kind of that that first uh, um, opportunity to connect uh, through through the collab. So that that again, kind of reminds me so much of kind of the human library model of kind of creating pathways for kind of very, very easy opportunities for people to connect. Um, and so there's just uh, in some ways, so much, so much in common. Um, and yeah, I want to thank uh, Aisha, Dan, and Jennifer for for expressing some interest. We'll we'll definitely follow follow up with you. And like I said, uh, we're small but mighty this afternoon. Um, and it's it's uh, it's always um, uh, quality. Um, um, but uh, but yeah, I think this is great. And I just put in the chat. Um, I don't know if everyone is aware of this, but uh, it also reminds me when when we're talking about opportunities for librarians to collaborate together. Um, it reminds me a little bit about this amazing um, kind of uh, library collaboration that started during COVID-19 um, among public libraries in Illinois. Uh, they started this Illinois Libraries pre Present uh, kind of event series. So an individual public library probably couldn't get Nick Offerman and Jeff Tweedy to come <laughs> do a program for like a random public library somewhere in rural Illinois. Um, but by finding ways to, to kind of collaborate and work together, um, they were able and continue to bring in kind of these, these very, um, yeah, famous individuals that would would kind of exceed the capacity of any any individual library so i think the the, the possibilities are are really um um yeah the sky's the limit uh, that's that's kind of what i always say the sky's the limit when when we find ways to work together right i'd like to just piggyback on that with the wilder foundation in the 90s did some investigating they do a lot of research on collaborations and what they look like and how to make them successful um, they have some recent uh, publications but initially they were saying there's three types of ways that you can work with another organization the easiest way is just to cooperate with them you're not really interchanging your assets at all you're just showing up to do something in their space you're just cooperating so that's a really easy um thing to do with with an unknown entity um, as you're trying to build the trust and then you can coordinate with them which is is more of a, a deeper exchange of uh, resources and um, ideas and credit so you're coordinating and then they they described collaboration as 
a, a full partnership where the exchange of resources is unlimited and where the credit for the projects or pr uh, project that comes out of these discussions where there's lots of trust be among the entities to truly exchange as much as possible while retaining your mission so that um, you have the maximum creativity and innovation happening over the exchange of these resources. And I wanted to add a, a fourth uh, type of working with each other, and that's mentoring. And uh, that's something that doesn't get mentioned in their literature. But I think that in especially in the library field, when you meet someone that has a skill or knowledge base or experience doing X, and that's something you want to learn, then creating a mentorship uh, relationship with that entity or that person um, over you know, a long period of time can be one of the most rewarding ways of working with others. So I think there's four actual categories for working with each other, cooperating, coordinating, collaborating, and mentoring. Yeah, that that's great, Beth. Um, and and I I just wanted to make a a, a quick shout out, uh, Kendra. You may know about this, uh, but um, uh, uh, the Wilder kind of index. Um, some of those resources are incorporated in this uh, community partnership and collaboration guide. Um, that Web Junction put out as small part of the small libraries create smart spaces. Um, so uh, I, what, what I like uh, uh, about this is that uh, none of this is necessarily new information. It's not, uh, and, and it's really, um, I love kind of how the CoLab model, um, it really doesn't try to make it more complicated than it needs to be. I think, uh, and, and kind of with respect to kind of the wild, wilder things, I think that that kind of more academic kind of <laughs> from coordination, I mean, that's, that's, that's great, I guess, as far as that goes. But um, I mean, I think, uh, I always say like let's just get people in a room and get them talking and and we'll kind of like the well <laughs> it can it can helpful to have that that theoretical foundation but let's let's just figure out how we can get people talking and and I think that's that's 90% of 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 the work um um and so I love kind of this um and yeah, we just we just have a, a couple of minutes left. Um, but um, but yeah, like um, uh, like I said, uh, would definitely encourage uh, people to check out Beth's books, um, which like Beth said, um, the CoLab book is now available in over 800 libraries, um, and so it may be available in a library near you, um, uh, or you can uh, get a copy. Um, uh, you can also uh, email Beth uh, at any point, um, and um, and I'll make sure to include um, uh, Beth's website um, uh, in the post event follow up. Um, but uh, but like I said, uh, we'll definitely uh, be following up with some of you who are interested in potentially participating um, in this project um, uh, to really bring uh, the collab uh, approach to to public libraries uh, via this. Uh, this train the trainer model that we're we're developing, um, and would love to have your participation uh, if if we try to do so. Um, uh, but this has been a great opportunity for us all to grow together. Um, and uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed um, the opportunity to talk with you. And and Beth, uh, any any final thoughts before we uh, break for the day? Well, I'm thrilled to have met Noah through LinkedIn. And uh, then I visited him at uh, UNC Greensboro, and we had a conversation and planned out this IMLS project. Um, it happened really quickly. Um, I think that uh, my next journey is into public libraries and how we can make the collab available um, to, to you all, because I think that's really where the leverage is going to be and where the magic is going to happen for most communities and not particularly in academic libraries. So uh, I feel like I've kind of been adopted by um, Noah to work in this public library space. And I hope that um, it's the beginning of, you know, the future of my uh, career development and journey. Appreciate it, Noah. Yeah, why well, I, I appreciate you, Beth, and it's been great, great learning about all the successes you've had, and and really just uh, I I can't say enough about uh, the model. It's just truly phenomenal. So, 
thank you for developing it. And, and I'm really excited about the possibilities of, of really kind of uh, embedding this deeply um, into public librarianship to ultimately transform uh, how, how library workers are, are seen and perceived uh, in their communities. Um, so thanks everyone for coming today and, and for your participation throughout the month of April for folks who've attended previous um, events. Um, look for your email next week. We'll be sending kind of a post-event uh, wrap up uh, as well as a short uh, survey to get your feedback. Um, and and um, yeah, thanks everyone uh, and, and have, a, have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye-bye.